it for Clock on Tuesday, and you know what that means, don't you? It's time for another exciting episode of Taxi's Quarantini Happy Hour. Yahoo! No magic here, no mystery in what I do. I hit the buttons, the hand flies up, you know I've hit those buttons. Welcome back from the holiday weekend. Today we're going to talk about using delays and phase correction to solve audio problems. And I know that doesn't sound that exciting, but you haven't heard anybody tell it like I tell it. It's going to be very exciting. Uh, hello, everybody. How are you guys? Let me make sure I've got you. Come on, Paige, refresh. And there I am. Okay, we are good to go. Not telling me I've got any viewers, but you guys can see me and hear me, right? Yes, you're saying hello. Um, hello, Ewart Williams, Peter Rahill, Martin Gravel, Jan Wylage, Jesse J. Peck, Dan Weber, Pat Wara, uh, Richly Authentic, Chris Anderson, Michael Lehman, <clears throat> Darren Fletcher, Dean Turner. Okay, the gang is here. So I wasn't joking. I know this sounds like it's going to be boring, but... Uh, Something I looked at, I, I barely, you guys would be proud of me, I barely turned on my computer over the entire holiday weekend. I hope you guys had a great fourth. I know I did. I think my light's a little too close today. Anyway, not to worry, because I just care about audio. Picture, not so much. Anyway, uh, I had a great fourth. Had uh, my daughter, her husband, and our grandkids over for a little barbecue, and then went to fireworks with the Shirelli family as we do pretty much every year, 4th of July. It's great to see them. We haven't hung out together now in like 17 months, so it was really great to see them. Um, let's see. So at some point, I did turn on a computer this weekend. I can't remember why can't remember what I was looking for, but something made me think of audio and, oh, I know, I was watching a video on YouTube and the drums sounded great. They sounded really live, really roomy, but man, oh man, every time the guy hit his crash cymbal, it just sounded like, it just was everywhere. And uh, I thought, you know, I used to run into that problem and then I finally figured out a few solutions. There is no one particular solution that works for solving that problem in every context because the contexts contexts are different. Um, you know, it's one thing if you're recording like a laid back mellow song and the drummer has got kind of a light touch and hits the cymbals like cha. It's another thing if you're doing metal and the drummer is like whacking the cymbal trying to knock it off its stand or possibly break it. So uh, anyway, I want to get into this stuff. I want to go lower my air conditioner. It's been hot enough lately that it cranks and cranks and cranks and then it gets to I think 3.30 or 4 p.m. and the building that we're in has my thermostat set to go back up to 73. So I'll be back in 30 seconds. Maybe even like 10 seconds. Here I am, back in the saddle again. That's exactly what happened. All the numbers on my thing were like 74 degrees. Not cool, <laughs> no pun intended. So anyway, are you guys ready to hear some audio stuff, learning how to use delays and phase correction to solve audio problems that you might otherwise try to solve with an equalizer or a compressor or some other form of plug-in? Nowadays, I think everybody is just plug-in happy. It's like, I've got a problem or I want to get that sound. I'll just use a plug-in. But people don't understand the, the physics of audio, and I won't get too deep into the weeds, but I do want to share some old school methods that I learned 40 years ago. Wow. Um, that'll make your room mics, live drums, live strings, and guitars sound better. Um, I'm catching up on what you guys are saying. Okay. So, uh, 
Yeah, high cut filter, uh, a light high cut filter does help, uh, but it also can hurt other stuff in the process. But, so let's talk about the physics of sound and how they pertain to, you know, what you can do using delays and phase correction. Um, did you know? Uh, everybody who already knew this, give me a plus one. Be honest, because I had forgotten about it, but when I was re doing a little bit of research for the show, I went, oh, that's right. Uh... I'm not going to ask for the number because people will Google it. But did you know that sound travels at approximately 1,100 feet per second? Approximately, not exactly. 1,100 feet per second. Um, high frequency waves are shorter. They're more squished together, whereas low frequency waves are more uh, long, loopy, and big. They are both called sine waves. Or as some people call them, sinus, which gives me a headache. Um, so yeah, like a bass wave. I remember, I can't remember what note, but I was working on a record back when I was a kid. And somebody said, uh, asked me to move the bass cabinet to the far end of the room and to put the microphone 30 feet from the bass cabinet. And I went, why? And they said because it takes that much distance for a bass note in the, you know, like an, a, a low E, whatever the note was, you know, um, in, in uh, to form out in the room. Maybe it was a G, I don't remember, but it takes about 30 feet for that waveform moving through the air to fully develop. So, uh, not to get hung up on the number 30, but did you know that it takes about 30 milliseconds for a sound wave, a sound, that. It takes 30 milliseconds for that to travel uh, 30 feet because sound travels at approximately 1,100 feet per second. So I'm, I'm rounding a little bit here, but about 30 feet um, and 30 milliseconds. So uh, what does 30 milliseconds sound like? How much delay is that? Well, I'm so glad you asked because I'm going to get out two pencils and show you approximately what 30 milliseconds sounds like. Here's one pencil. Here's two pencils. Hear the difference? A slight, ever so slight, flam, really slight. That's about 30 milliseconds. Okay, so here is an interesting um, factoid. A lot of times people will set up a room mic. Uh, this goes back to that video that I heard on YouTube and it made me think about this because the guy's drums were very roomy sounding. People will set up a room mic on a guitar amp, on a drum kit, and they put it like way far away in the room because they want to capture the whole room. I've seen guys that will take you know the big booms and put the mics like a pair of 414s or 87s maybe even an Omni if they're feeling really creative and stick them up in the high corner of the room 30 feet away. Uh, and then they've got a problem, which is that the delay, it takes that 30, it takes 30 milliseconds to get from point A to point B being the back of the room. So now you've got that really long delay, but you can effectively close that distance between a room mic and the close mic to get the tone you're after without the delay. Because really when people use a room mic, more often than not, they want the largesse of the room. They want the, the tone, the sound of the instrument in the room, but they don't necessarily want that delay, that 30 millisecond delay. If anybody's timing this at home using some computer or an app on their phone, that's what sounds like 30. Here, I'm going to do 30 milliseconds again. There. That's about, that's more like 50, 75. It's very close. 30 milliseconds is probably imperceptible to the average person's ear. A trained engineer who listens to these things over and over could probably identify it. But I would be willing to bet that if I took a hundred random people off the street and said, tell me when you hear a delay between 
the sound source and, and you know the sound happening again. Um, most people probably wouldn't identify it until 50 milliseconds or 75 milliseconds, something like that. Um, so by, I want to get this straight. So what you want to do is eliminate the delay in some circumstances. You want to eliminate the delay because you don't want to have the room. You don't want to have that 30 millisecond slap sound, even as faint as it is. Uh, but what you do want is, again, the tone and the largesse of the room. You want the volume, the cubic volume of the room brings a tonality, especially to drums and guitar amps. So how do you eliminate the delay? By throwing a 30 millisecond delay on the original sound source. So if you throw a 30 millisecond delay on the original drums, um, now the, the room mic in the room mics in the back of the room are going to be in the same time plane as the original. You can't bring the microphones forward in time, but you can move the original sound source back. And you're probably thinking, well, hell, who, why would you want to do that? Because 30 milliseconds is pretty imperceptible. And to move the drums back 30 milliseconds in the track is probably not going to wreak havoc. Um, I don't have a drum kit or a studio in my house. Well, I happen to have one right here, but <laughs> I don't have a drum kit. So uh, I couldn't test that, but I do remember doing that. And back in the day, you gotta remember, back when I was a full-time engineer, um, I'm trying to remember, like I had a Lexicon prime time. Um, I hated that thing. Now it's become a piece of classic gear. I hated it, hated it, hated it, hated it. Uh, at Criteria, we had early eventide uh, delays. And it was so funny because the chips were so big, but so inefficient. Uh, and proce the processing power of the chips was so bad that um, you couldn't get any fidelity out of each delay tap. So if something was, you know, like 50 milliseconds, it had less top end than the original. If it were 100 milliseconds, the top end would go away by a factor of two. So every delay would have less fidelity. And in nature, that actually happens from sound bouncing around. Um, you do lose top end and overall fidelity, but you lose it because of the naturally occurring phase cancellation that happens within an acoustic environment. Weren't you impressed that I got that right? For those of you who are paying attention and not talking about what you're drinking today. Um, anyway, so yeah, you do lose top end. However, when you're doing what I described before, which is you want the sound of the room, but you don't want the sound of the delay, therefore you are going to throw a very short delay on the original sound source so that it then, it moves them into the same plane rather than being boom, sound source and delay, sound source and delay, you bring them together on the same plane so that they sound unified. But the whole thing, remember, has been moved back 30 milliseconds from the track. <laughs> from the track. But 30 milliseconds in most tracks won't be perceptible. And if anything, it might actually make the drummer feel like uh, they are more in the pocket. Did you know that that's, a, that's to me, the most desirable, two most desirable things about a, a drummer, something that defines a great drummer for me in the context of making records is number one, they have to be really in the pocket. And I have found that the drummers that are really in the pocket are usually ever so slightly behind the beat. Again, it's dependent and contingent upon the genre of music that you're doing the tempo of the song, the busyness of the part, what is the bass doing in conjunction with the kick drum, all those things come into play. And as a producer, you have to be able to, you don't get three hours to solve that problem in a control room at 300 bucks an hour. You get a minute or two, maybe even seconds. 
So you have to be able to tell rather quickly, okay, this is the problem. Uh, it's because we're doing speed metal and the kick drums are just happening so fast that in relation to the delay that they're slapping back in each other and causing a wash and it's problematic, blah, blah, blah. If it were a country song, a nice 4-4 country song, you know, at a mid-tempo, I don't know, what, 102 maybe BPM, something like that, um, then it would probably be okay. So there's that. Also things like uh, how much EQ? Do you have a lot of top end on the kick drum attack? Um, do you have a wood beater versus a felt beater? What's the um, head on the kick drum tuned to? What octave is the bass playing in? What key is the song? All those things. You don't sit there with a slide rule figuring it out when you're in the engineer's chair or the producer's chair. You just know. Instinctively you go, uh, I can't slap a 30 second delay on that to put them both on the same time frame plane. Uh, because if I do, I'm gonna have a problem because the drummer is playing double kicks at some insane BPM in the context of a heavy metal song. It's not gonna work. Um, yeah, all those decisions. You don't sit there and think, hmm, could it be this? Could it be that? You just know. It's kind of like, you know what? It, it's very much like driving a car. You don't really think when you're making a right-hand turn. You might think, okay, I'm gonna put on my uh, turn indicator, but you don't sit there and think, okay, left hand over right hand, right hand over left hand, and that's about enough. And now we're bringing it back because we're straightening it. You don't, you just do it. That's what I'm talking about, just doing it. God, those folks at Nike are smart. Um, so all this is called, all of it falls under the umbrella of psychoacoustics. Psychoacoustics, I should have actually looked up the definition. I'm going to do that right now. Definition of psychoacoustics. Here's the definition of psychoacoustics, the branch of psychology psychoacoustics. concerned with the perception of sound and its physiological effects. The branch of psychology concerned with the perception of sound and its physical effects. Um, I don't like that definition. <laughs> a branch of science dealing with the perception of sound, the sensations produced by sounds, and the problems of communication. Man, if you put the word psycho in anything and they just muck it all up. Uh, psychoacoustics is how you perceive sound. So one thing probably many of you know, maybe not all of you if you're kind of early in your engineering game, is you can change um, if you shut your eyes where the listener thinks he, she, or it is hearing the sound from by where the original is panned and how much delay or throwing a delay and then how much delay you have on another one and where you pan the delay, you can create an artificial space by the use of delay. Psychoacoustics. Um, Actually, anytime you're in a recording studio with a band, you're probably dealing with some psychos in an acoustic environment, just saying. Uh, so, I'm reading my own notes, trying to make sense of them, sorry. <laughs> so, you use delays to create perceived distance and or placement in the oral landscape. That's called psychoacoustics. Yes, it is. Okay. Oh, good. I have two pages of notes. Uh, using delays, whether created organically or by using distant or room mics or by, uh, sorry, using delays, whether created organically. You can create delay organically by using distant room mics. The farther the mic from the original sound source, the more the delay is. Or by using electronic delays, which can cause phase anomalies, comb filtering, and phase cancellation. Okay. Put on your boots, we're getting ready to go into the weeds, folks. Um, we all know what the Doppler effect is, right? When you are standing at a train station and the 502 doesn't have any brakes and it goes flying by, you hear, and the, and the pitch actually change as the train goes by. That's the Doppler effect. Um, you can create Let's say you're in a room, that, a jail cell, a room with nice hard walls. Let's take the bars off and let's just have four concrete walls in a six by nine room. 
Um, the ceiling and the floor concrete. Uh, your roommate's name is Bubba. And you and Bubba are sitting in, in the cell and you're <coughs> clapping your hands. You're going to hear so many bounces between those two parallel hard surface shiny walls that those bounces, those sound waves are going to bump into each other and they are going to create um, a form of reverb, but it's going to be very fluttery because the walls are not irregularly shaped. There's not a peak ceiling or you know, some irregular shape to cause those anomalies in the way things reflect that you're going to end up with a very controlled thing and you're going to have waves crossing waves. Eventually that creates, instead of whap whap, when you have a lot of whap whaps going on, <laughs> really technical stuff. I told you we're putting on our boots and going into the weeds. When you have a lot of whap whaps <laughs> running into each other, what you get is reverb. Reverb is the the recycling of those slaps and the decaying thereof is reverb, okay? So that's organic. That is an organic psychoacoustic event. You can, can, can create a virtually identical thing by using delays, or you could just get a reverb plug-in from Valhalla and just say, give me a six foot by nine foot room and a roommate named Bubba. So, what you get, though, sometimes is called comb filtering. And what comb filtering is, let me draw you up pictures. I love drawing pictures. Where's the Sharpie? There's the Sharpie. Whoa, my color is just out of control today. Okay, that is a sine wave. Woo, look at all that snow down there in the corner. Wow. Okay, that is called... <laughs> I need a, a technical director for this show. Look, I am orange. Um, <laughs> that is called a sine wave. Um, when you get the sine waves colliding with each other, it takes certain frequencies because of the time differential from signal A or sound A to sound B. Um, depending on the time differential, each one of those lines represents a frequency that gets knocked out because of phase cancellation, which means that the sine wave, you now get the inverse of the sine wave. So. I can't believe I remember this stuff. Carl Richardson would be so proud of me because he taught me this stuff when I was 19 years old, and that was a long time ago. Really long time, 47 years ago? Is that possible? Um, is it possible? <laughs> Hold on, I have to do some math. Forty-six years ago. Wow. Okay, so I'm remembering this from a Recording Institute of America class, Recording Institution of America, whatever, RIAA, whatever that stands for, um, class that Carl Richardson, who was one of the senior engineers at Criteria, he went on to co-produce all the Bee Gees' big hits and a bunch of other great records. Um, and he was a mentor of mine, and he was part of the Road Rally last year. So if you get... There's that sine wave again. And then another sine wave that collides with it at exactly the right time differential and frequency, you get what are called null points, which I don't know how to draw. <clears throat> I'm messing this up big time. <laughs> this is how Picasso got started. Anyway, they run into each other, and what that causes is things being 180 degrees out of phase. And when you get that, the, the sound rising, the top of the curve on the sine wave collides with the same frequency, but at a slightly different time setting, 
to cause a cancellation because you have full volume and no volume and it ends up being a null point which is the flat line i shouldn't be teaching this stuff we should have like what's his name something nigh the science guy he could do this better um okay covered all that let's see in the world of home studios and everything being in the box, most home engineers don't know much about the physics of sound. Therefore, here's the important part, therefore they end up trying to solve every little problem with EQ, compression, or an all-in-one plug-in, like, you know, Chris Lord, LG, you know, turn the dial and your vocals sound amazing. Turn the dial and your bass sounds amazing. Because they think you're not smart enough to know that you should have you know, a compressor, a compressor, maybe a double compressor, or what, you know, what the juicy frequencies are for a bass. So they just put all that stuff into a thing and sell it to you for 35 bucks and you turn up the one knob and the bass sounds great. Well, that's great, but you haven't learned anything. You've made a good sounding bass sound on that record or that song, but you haven't learned anything about the physics of sound. So therefore you are not in control of your own music's sonic destiny. And that's not good. If you are completely reliant on plugins for every little aspect of your sound, if you're constantly creating and fixing sounds by using plugins, especially the all in ones, um, you are not the master of your domain. Chris Lord Algae is the master of your domain, but what if that sound that his box makes isn't really right for that song that you're doing? What if you don't know if it's right or not because you don't have enough skills to control this stuff so that you could go, it's just not right. I got to work harder. I've got to do something different. Um, otherwise, if you're the kind of person that's so reliant on the all in one, one big fat knob, uh, it's so funny. So many of the plugins say easy to use. And I know it's a turnoff that people that are just learning don't want to get something with too many parameters because it's a pain in the butt. To, you got to understand stuff. Um, and it slows down the creative process. So there is some value in having you know, the all-in-one with the big knob you turn it and the bass sounds pretty. But does a speed metal bass sound pretty or is it a country bass? Or is it a Hofner bass versus a jazz bass or a P bass or a Rickenbacker bass? because they all sound different. They all need different treatments. So I'm not so sure that those all-in-ones work for everything. I think they work well for some things, but not for everything. So now we've got the phase cancellation. The aforementioned incredibly good drawing I did of phase cancellation, right? So you wouldn't know about phase cancellation unless you're aware that phase is an issue, right? And you don't know how to solve the problem unless you know to look for the problem so that you can be aware. So back in my day, back in the days when I used to walk to school in three feet of snow with 12 degrees below zero outside in my bare feet, back in those days, what we used to do was hit a button on the console that had four letters on it. M-O-N-O. -O. Mono. Put the drums in mono, and if uh, your tom-toms start to sound like corrugated, uh, I was gonna, I've got a corrugated cardboard box sitting on the couch in my office, but I don't want to get up again. That would be rude. But if your tom-toms go from sounding like doo, boo, boo, to sounding like that is a phase problem. It shouldn't sound like a tick or a smack or a thud. It should sound like boosh, right? Boosh, exactly like that. So in order to get that sound, you've got to identify where the phase problems are coming from. And there are rules with microphones about how close that they should be to the sound source relative to how close they are to each other. That's where the phase anomalies come in. Uh, most people blow it with drums by trying to have like an under snare mic and an over snare mic and an under tom mic and an over. I almost said the F word. Forget that shit. <laughs> Forget that stuff. Forget it. 
You don't need mics on the bottom and mics on the top. That's for people who don't know what they're doing. Um, it's for people who probably just have a big knob all in one thing. Um, you're going to get phase cancellation. You've got two microphones, one down here, one up here, and the sound source in the middle. And, you know, if the sound source is like dead center in the middle of those two things, what do you get? Phase cancellation because the two waveforms are meeting in the same time frame at the same frequency and the same amplitude, and you just get phase cancellation. And comb filtering, which basically takes certain frequencies out of being reproduced. And it's if you ever taken, uh, if you look at it uh, on a, an oscillator, it looks like the teeth of a comb. That's why they call it comb filtering. So eliminate all those bottom microphones uh, because until you master getting a great drum sound with just microphones on the top, don't even go there. It's like, I want to be an Olympic diving champ, but you don't know how to swim yet. Forget it. You're going to drown. You're going to hurt yourself. So what you want to do is, first of all, get your overhead mics closer to the cymbals than you probably thought they should be. Not so close that when somebody whacks a cymbal really hard that the cymbal's going to jump up and take your 414 and knock the capsule off the microphone, the windscreen and the capsule. Um, or that the drummer is going to take a stick and... and put a beautiful dent in the windscreen of your Neumann 87. Nope, 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 you don't want that. So uh, if I had to say a good starting point, I would recommend somewhere around 12 inches. Um, just take the symbol, move it with your hand. This is a symbol and make sure that on its upward travel, if it's whacked here and it goes up there, that it's not gonna hit your microphone. Also keep it on the far side of the symbol so that the drummer doesn't whack it with a stick. So put it about a foot above the cymbals. Um, if you put it three feet above the cymbals because you're trying to get all roomy and cool sounding, you're going to find that there's more that the mics are closer to each other in this plane than they are to the sound source in that plane. And what you're going to get is phase cancellation. So eliminate extraneous microphones more is not better on a drum set um, hit the mono mono button and whatever disappears the microphone placed on that drum is probably too far away from it move it closer even by half an inch and all of a sudden even in mono you're going to hear it go Doosh! again and you're going to go gosh michael was right Phase cancellation is the enemy, unless you want it to be your friend. That's a whole other chapter in this book. So um, you can use the, the mono button to check the, the phase of mixes. If you add a stereo acoustic guitar to a mix and you bring the two faders up to, let's say, zero on the little marking things by the fader buttons, fader knobs, um, and you've got one pan full left and one pan full right. And if you hit the mono button and that acoustic guitar disappears in the mix, what does that mean? It means you recorded it in stereo and you recorded it out of phase, that your mic placement was not good. The mono button will tell you that. What you should have done was check it in mono before you laid down the track and you would have identified the problem, laid it on tape correctly and you wouldn't have to check that out in the mix. But you would be shocked how many times, I used to have an assistant named Paul that was a very bright young man. Um, he rose up through the ranks quickly and I started letting him engineer sessions for me like that I didn't want to do. <laughs> I had him do vocal overdubs with pain in the ass clients that I didn't want to be there for. I would go to the dentist um, and get a different form of root canal. And I would see Paul, sometimes I'd walk, come back after being gone for like four hours or something and walk back in the control room. And Paul would be sitting there going, where did the acoustic guitar go? I thought I just got that acoustic guitar sounding great. Well, you did all by its lonesome but you didn't check it in mono and now it's gone in the mix. Um, so Paul, you need to pay attention to phase. Now, I remember with these, oh, you can't see them. Yeah, with those NS10s right there. 
Um, when I first hooked him up, uh, and I always pull out the Steely Dan song, Asia, that's my reference song, because I know exactly what the relationships of different elements that should be like. Um, and back in the day when I was still working in the studio, I would bring a copy. Um, I had actually had a digital copy at one point um, of Asia, and I, I would bring that into the studio and listen. You don't have to have it sound like you want it to sound. You just have to understand what's missing. Like, was the bottom end fatter? Was the bottom end skinnier? Was the mid range smoother, less strident? All those things. And you make kind of a mental note. You readjust your thinking and your ears and your brain, and you move forward with the record because sometimes you can't change the room if you're a guest engineer especially if there's somebody else, like if you're mixing at night and somebody else is doing overdubs by day, they don't want you changing the positioning of the speakers or anything. In any case, I set up my NS10s in my office and I put on Steely Dan and what did I hear? I heard really, really, really bad sounding drums and a really thin sounding bass and the dead giveaway is if the kick drum, the snare drum, and the lead vocal, if you shut your eyes, if they are not down the middle, there's a pretty good chance that your speaker wires are out of phase. Do you know how to identify the two sides, the positive and the negative um, of speaker cable? Oftentimes, um, it doesn't matter. It can be, um, sometimes it'll be like a silver wire and a copper wire. So. I always go for um, red is positive, black is negative. I believe that's what they are in a car battery. I could be wrong about that, but I think that's what it is. So to stay uniform, I've always gone with that color coding. However, sometimes there is both sides of the wire are the same, you know, they're both copper or something, so you don't know. Um, and sometimes they actually have like a little tiny white rib or a line down the side like zip cord like um, do I have any zip cord nearby I do not um, and another way to tell is sometimes there would just be a little ribbing on one side zip cord being the, like the kind of cord that's on a lamp that you would plug into a wall and a lot of people use that it works pretty well as speaker wire um, unless you're getting into the more esoteric stuff like you know Megami oxygen free speaker wire I don't know that that really makes a difference. Maybe it does. I'm old enough where I couldn't hear it, so I don't care. Um, <laughs> Jay, Jay Pearson playing hooky a lot. He's probably got his life back, you guys. Um, so that's it. Uh, you find out, you, you sit there, and I, I've seen people work for months in a control room. Otherwise, intelligent people working for months in a control room going, there's just something wrong, and they start ripping out walls excuse me, ripping out walls and changing acoustics and moving the console front and back and doing all these measurements and bringing in a pink noise generator and, and doing, you know, audio measurements using pink noise and white noise and God only knows what other colors and noise. And, and they can never get it right. They didn't do the most basic thing, which is just make sure that your speakers are wired in phase. If the copper wire goes to the red terminal on your left speaker, the copper wire should go to the red terminal on your right speaker. It's that simple. So um, check it out. Hit the mono button and you will know. Um, binaural microphones. Um, binaural means that the same so sound source, like your ears are X number of inches apart. The average head has a certain amount of density to it. The average ear is angled such. The average opening of an ear is about this. So they studied all these things and came up with averages and then uh, stuck, whoops, my email is still open. Let me close that. So they um, took a head, I can't remember, I had one. I had a binaural head back in like 78, 79, 80, and 81, I believe. His name was Herman because he looked like Herman Munster a little bit. Um, I think it was made by AK, AKG or Sennheiser. And basically, the microphones were built into the ears. This thing was built 
to hear sound as the average human person hears sound. So I would take Herman, and there was a microphone screw-in thingy on the bottom of Herman's neck. You know, he was like, from there up. And we'd screw him on a, a bigger boom, you know, like one of the, not a regular mic boom like you'd use on stage, but like the big studio jobs. And then we would have Herman uh, sitting over a drum set. Hmm, how can I demonstrate that? Like that, at that kind of angle, a 45 degree angle, looking at the drums from about 10 feet away. And I've got to be honest, um, although the tom-toms and the snare sounded great and the kick all sounded great, I always had a problem with the cymbals being overly bright in the mix, sounding really washy in the mix, uh, and just being inappropriately loud in, in the overall balance of the drums. So I couldn't get the tonality of being a little distant from the drums without getting the cymbals. It's actually why the Bee Gees and some other groups that did disco records back in the day actually cut stuff with just like a kick and a snare uh, and put moving blankets over the cymbals or took them off the stands and laid them on the floor and then would go back and overdub the cymbals as a standalone later, which probably affected the feel somewhat, but I guess they had enough time and money they could keep doing it till they perfected it. So. Anyway, um, check everything in phase. And that whole experience with Herman the binaural head and getting too many, too much of the symbols in there, it never, it didn't cross my mind at the time. And it was probably five years after that that I discovered something. And I can't remember if it was something that Tom Dowd told me or Carl Richardson told me or Bill Simzik maybe. Somebody somewhere in my days of being a puppy in the industry said, room mic should be knee high. Well, that looks dopey, doesn't it? You think of room mics and you want to go, oh, I've got all this cubic volume, so I'm going to move these room mics as far back as I can get them, maybe put them up in the corner, you know, at the far end of the room, get them up nice and high so they can hear what's going on up there at the ceiling. The cymbals are the highest thing in the kit. They were the closest thing to Herman the binaural heads, face, and ears. One day I discovered or remembered that somebody told me that they discovered um, if you take your room mics and put them knee high, you're going to get the bottom of the snare and you're going to get the kick drum. And those are the, probably, in my opinion, the two most important aspects of tonality that you want to get by using room mics on a drum kit. And by keeping them down that low, you're probably cutting the amount of sonic energy coming off the cymbals into the, those microphones by 30, 40% maybe. So that's a plus. So remember that. Next time you want to use room mics on a live drum kit, even on a, a, a Marshall cabinet or a Fender Twin or who knows, um, don't move it up high necessarily. Try it down knee high. If you put it down by the floor, because of the aforementioned reflections I was talking about in the six foot by nine foot jail cell, um, people will sometimes take a microphone and put it really close to the floor. And you get so much of that uh, reflective energy off the floor compared to the direct energy you're getting off the face of the mic or off the face of the guitar amp that it will cause phase anomalies and that comb filtering effect. So it will sound really thin. Um, trying to think what else I can tell you. I'm looking at my notes. Always check your phase. With, if you're running a direct box and a mic on a bass amp, I'd say at least 50% of the time, if not more, it, those two things are gonna be out of phase with each other. So you wanna, again, hit that, either the phase switch on the direct box or, uh, the, face switch on the console, whatever you've got. Face switch, good thing to have. Um, oh, and the last thing I want to talk about, but not until I take a swig of this because I have a tickle in my throat. All right. I don't know how to do this without pictures, but if you want to get an awesome room sound on a drum kit, and you've got a moderately, like a medium reflective room that the drums are in. Um, 
and you can put um, some sort of, you know, gobos, splays, baffles, whatever, around the drum kit. Um, you guys know what figure eight pattern is on a microphone, right? Do I have a sheet of paper I can use? There you go. Oh, remember this? The day I did my homemade shotgun mic. <laughs> All right, well, forget about the homemade shotgun mic. All right, um, I'm going to draw some microphone patterns. They're not going to be incredibly accurate. Alrighty then, if you had a bird's eye view of a microphone, most microphones are in cardioid, which is that guy right there. There's a little rejection. Actually, I drew that backwards. This part, again, we're looking straight down at the microphone, which is standing up and down. So this part um, picks up pretty much all the way around the microphone, but it does get less sensitive on the back of the microphone, depending if it's cardioid or hypercardioid is the area of sensitivity on the back. So it's mainly made to pick up out here in the frontal region. This is an omnidirectional microphone. It picks up all the way around 360 degrees. This is what we're interested in. Right there, that's a figure eight, okay? So there's the front of the microphone and the back of the microphone. So if you've got a drum kit and you don't want to get the cymbals, but you want to get the room sound, take a pair of microphones that are figure eight. And quite frankly, if I remember correctly, I tried a pair of ribbon microphones, which are naturally figure eight, because a ribbon microphone picks up, a ribbon microphone actually uses like a mylar ribbon, a static, electrostatic mylar ribbon. So it picks up this way, and it picks up that way, but it doesn't pick up very well this way or this way. So what you do is take advantage of where it doesn't pick up. So you point the null spot, the dead zone on the microphone. If it picks up here and it picks up there, put the drum kit. The drum kit is out here and the microphone is like this it's not gonna pick up the cymbals very well because the frequency response in the upper ranges, which is where the cymbals are, um, sounds like crap on the side of a ribbon microphone that's naturally figure eight. But what it is gonna pick up is the reflection off the wall over there and the reflection off the wall over there, which is gonna be a lot of that boomy low end energy, which makes the drum sound fierce. So to summarize that, Take two, I don't remember the model numbers, but the Royer ribbon microphones, I think they make some that are like two or 300 bucks now. Make sure they're in figure eight, which I think all ribbon microphones probably are. Um, I said that like a, an Australian <laughs> or a New Zealander. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, take a pair of ribbon microphones, set them up with the same amount of gain at the preamp stage, the same amount of limiting or compression, um, assuming that they're identical mics. They don't have to be perfectly like a matched pair, although that would be ideal. That just means somebody tested their frequency response and, response and they're identical. Close enough. Nobody's gonna buy one less copy of your hit record because your microphones weren't exactly matched. But it makes it more fun as an engineer when they are. And you can say, oh, it's a matched pair. Isn't that cool? So you do that. The Royer 121s, there you go. Andre's always got the answer for stuff like that. Um, so now, because you've got the null points pointing towards the symbols, it's not gonna pick up the symbols, but the figure eight pattern is gonna pick up the walls on either side of the room, and you're gonna get the room with far less of the symbols. So there you go. There's my extremely deep into the weeds, layperson's explanation of how time 
delay, psychoacoustics, and excuse me, phase correction can be your friends to solve your audio problems. How was that? Really, really, really good, right? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, um, now I can just hang out with you guys because I've done my spiel. Spiel. Michael's Academy. Boy, if anybody asked me to actually teach something, that would scare me. I think, is next week the top 10? Um, I don't know. I've been trying to get somebody who I don't want to disclose. Uh, July 19th is the top 10. Next week, I've got somebody that I've been playing phone tag with for a week. She would make an excellent guest. I would love to have her. If she doesn't get back to me by Thursday of this week, then we'll move the top 10 up to the 12th. Um, Oh, yeah, Sound Gym. Uh, so you checked it out, right? I had such a nice... I did like, I don't know, 45 minutes or an hour the other night with the CEO of Sound Gym. We did a, a Zoom together. Um, great guy. I really, really liked him. And uh, I would say we hit it off. We've got a bit of a bromance going. Um, I'm very excited to do some stuff with them. And uh, uh, Chris, tell me more. Tell me more. Tell me more. Richly Authentic, the top 10 is actually not technically a top 10. It's, it's 10 songs that our screeners or our staff found over the last 30 days where they went, oh, that's really cool. I like that. It could be, it might have made the list because it was just cool and different. Might be a spectacular vocal performance. Could be an incredibly well-written song. Could be an amazing instrumental. It can be anything, and it's not like these are the absolute top 10 best things that we've heard in the last 30 days. It's the 10 most interesting things that we've heard that we want to share. So we play them on the show once a month now. Secret guest. Well, she won't be secret. If, I, if we can quit playing phone tag, she won't be secret. Um... Uh, Chris Anderson said, I suck at identifying certain EQ. I was laughing so hard when I got on the uh, Zoom call um, or Zoom video call with the CEO of Sound Gym. And I said to him, I feel like such a doofus because I'm sure you can look. Uh, I signed up and, and took the test, you know, and one of the tests they have is they play you a piece of music and a certain frequency range within the bell curve is boosted and you have to kind of shut your eyes going, is that like around 1.5K or is it more like 700 or more like 4.3 or 5.8? What is that? And, and you guess, and, and frankly, I'm pretty darn good at doing it with instruments. Um, I don't know that I've ever sat down and listened to a mix and thought to myself, wow, that's got a, a little bit much of 4.3. Mastering engineers do that for a living. I don't know that, I've, uh, maybe I haven't, I just didn't even realize I was doing it, who knows. In any case, I was not nearly as good, and frankly, I didn't read the instructions very well. Um, I, I thought I sucked at that, and I was so like horrified that the CEO of the company is going, to himself, wow, I can't believe I've got a meeting tonight with this doofus that used to work at Criteria and worked with all these famous acts and uh, has spent thousands and thousands of hours sitting, you know, in, in these just incredible control rooms. Well, I wasn't sitting, I was working, but, um, <laughs> and I thought for sure he'd be like, this guy's got no credibility in my book because he doesn't know the first thing about anything. Anyway, um, I'm pretty sure if I read the instructions and practiced a little bit, but wow, it was enlightening and challenging and fun. And I think that he said they've got a half a million users all over the world using this thing. Um, so it, it is. You guys go check it out today. Um, Sound Gym. 
I can't remember if it's soundgym.co or soundgym.com. Do you remember, Chris? I'll look it up in my contacts. And then we're getting pretty close to the end of the day here. Wow. I should talk audio more often. Things go by so quickly. I didn't put it in my thing. Wow. I didn't put the web. Well, let's just go find out. I'm speaking about myself in third person, not right. Soundgym.co.co. Yeah, I thought that was the case. Anyway, please do check it out. Um, it's really fun, really challenging, and there is so much more to it than I ever would have thought. Uh, and I'm really proud of these guys. They, they're very smart, very nice, work very hard. It's been up and running now for five years, half a million users. For an audio thing, that says something. Uh, and there's a whole community built around it. So yeah, check it out. Let me know what you think. Um, I, I originally wanted to talk to him about being a sponsor for the Road Rally, but then when I realized how cool it was, like wanted to talk to him about everything. <laughs> Uh, hello, Douglas Fouquet. Yeah, it is a lot of fun. Check it out. We are, um, I got an email from him Sunday or Monday um, saying, hey, maybe we could do a little swap where I give your people a discount and you give my people a discount on taxi. So, Keep your eyes open for an email giving you uh, a discount, but please pay attention and, and respond quickly. Um, don't, you know, don't like hit them up a week later and say, hey, I remember Taxi offered a 30% off or something. Um, do I think I can interview a guest that is an audio engineer using a DAW? Would it be great? It would be great to transition, translate your knowledge into the digital world. The problem is doing the screen capture and the live setting. I mean, it, it can definitely be done. I can do that, you know, during the road rally. Um, if we have the screen capture person where I'm at and where um, our technical directors, you can do it on Zoom, but Zoom, it's hard to explain. Zoom is like a McDonald's hamburger. It's good when you're hungry, pretty reliable, works okay, um, but what it's not is like a steak at Ruth's Chris, right? So the software that we use is more like the steak. Uh, and therefore, it's a little more complicated, and frankly, I can't be the technical director and be the charming host that I'm required to be for every episode of Taxi TV and be doing click, 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 and ooh, did I get that? And, eh. So um, that's why I've not done it on the show. Um, and, and yes, uh, Akira, I'm sure, like the stuff I did last year with, um, uh, who did we have? We had Fett and I just want to say Conan O'Brien. Why can I never think of his name? I've only known him for like 25 years. Um, who was our other audio guy? Um, Big burly guy with long hair. Yeah, I could look at the rally page and tell you in a second. Ronan, yeah. I always want to say Conan O'Brien, you know? It's like when you get a, a mispronunciation of a word locked in your head and you can your mouth will, and you will only say it in the mispronounced way for the rest of your life. Or is that just me? I don't know. I've got that with like five words. Um, so yes. Uh, we will have those guys do it. Um, I was actually trying to think of topics. Um, here, I can tell you. I want to get one of our guys to do how to guess, get a glossy Sheen-like mix. And I don't mean Charlie Sheen or Martin Sheen. I mean, you know, a glossy mix that's got that extra little something that sounds like it's vinyl playing on radio. How do I get my mixes to sound like that? Am I correct in assuming that that is the ultimate question that everybody wants to know? Hey, 
And just for your information, stuff that I worked on back when I was still working in in fancy studios, when I to this day when I hear it in a grocery store and the speakers up in the ceiling, it never sounds as good as good to me as everybody else's stuff that plays from the same ceiling speakers at the grocery store. Pristine and dip it in isotope sauce. Isotope is is most likely coming back as a sponsor. Um, pristine and crystal clear. Uh, Dave Bennett gives a plus one. I wanted Ronan to do a class on hearing certain sounds and frequencies, i.e. honky vocals. Now, now, let's leave race out of it, damn it. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> a honky vocal? Well, that's the vocalist. <laughs> I guess you shouldn't goose the mid-range. <laughs> Whoa. Hold on. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Ken Mesford can hear bats. All right, guys. Well, it is 5.01. How are the gophers? Oh, hold on. I've got something. We're going a couple minutes long, Liz. I've got to show the kids something really funny. You know what it is because I showed it to the staff already today. I had a family come and visit last night. Not exactly a family I wanted to see. The mommy raccoon and her four baby raccoons visiting the Lasco household at three. Uh, check this out. They figured out that the fruit tea, they have now cleaned off the loquat tree. There's nothing left there. So that video oops, was at... Oh, it doesn't have the timestamp on it because I saved it. Anyway, they walk one direction at like 3.17 a.m. and they walk the other direction going back to whence they came at um, 4 or 3.18, one minute later. So it's like mom said, come on, kids, let's go get some free food over at the Lasco residence. And I don't know where the hell they come from because the camera only turns on when they get up to the patio. Um, and did I tell you about the hose? Did I tell you about the hose? I can't remember. Anyway, um, <laughs> they, they walk over there. It's like, oh, crap. No more loquats. All right, let's go to some other neighbor's yard. So literally, it's walking this direction and then that direction. Masked intruders. That's right. They look guilty, don't they? They just friggin' look like they're up to no good. Um, okay, so did I tell you guys the story about the hose already? The other night, uh, I was out in the backyard I like to do that maybe 10 minutes before I go upstairs to go to bed at night. I go out in the backyard and look at the stars and just enjoy it. And, um, I was out there and I heard something rustling in, in the in the bushes or in a tree. And I thought, I'll bet you it's a raccoon. So I get the, the garden hose and I've got one of those fancy hoses that's covered with ballistic nylon. Not the cheap green crappy one, but the one that like you'd have a hard time cutting it with a knife, seriously hard time cutting it with a knife. Um, and sure enough, I see these beady little eyes glowing at me from about 20 feet away, and the security light goes on, and lo and behold, there's a raccoon. Well, I, I didn't want to like, you know, hit him with a rock or anything, but I, I don't like raccoons as cute as they are, and I actually used to breed and raise Quatamundis when I was like 18 years old. So, you know, it's first cousin of raccoon, different face, same animal, basically. Um, South American version with a longer nose. And I like them, but I know how incredibly destructive they are. If you get one of those in your house, consider your house destroyed. If they see something on the outside of your house that they want to get into, they will get into it. They're very smart. They're smarter than dogs, smarter than cats. 
and they have like razor sharp teeth and really good claws for climbing and extremely dexterous little hands. So anyway, I turned on the hose and I'm sitting there laughing to myself like an a-hole that I'm squirting this high pressure water at this raccoon from like 20 feet away. Well, it was also like 105 degrees out that day. So what does the raccoon do? He sits up on his haunches, opens his mouth, and I'm spraying the raccoon, and he's literally like drinking from the proverbial fire hose. So I chuckled, and eventually I squirted his whole body with it, and he flipped me off and walked away with his little raccoon butt wiggling. And I thought, well, I've done my job here. A Couple days later, I realized I'd left the hose laying in the backyard and the, the gardener was coming to cut the lawn in a day or so. So I thought I would bring the hose back up to the patio and I grabbed the brass nozzle on the end. I start walking <laughs> and the hose is in two pieces. Actually, it was almost in three pieces. The raccoon came back and chewed through the ballistic nylon covering on the hose and destroyed my $45 hose. So there you go. And now that he knows where the water supply is, he's, he or she is bringing back the entire family of cute, adorable little baby raccoons who are probably gonna get hosed down tonight. Last thought, Deb and I went to a movie theater last night to see Cruella. First time we've been in a theater in 17 or 18 months. The movie Cruella is actually very funny and I mean, I like Emma Stone as an actress. I've always thought, wow, she's a good actress. She's cute. She's got a lot of personality. She's got an unusual, unique face and kind of a, a vibe, a presence. She, in the second half of that movie, her level of acting was so incredible. I'd be shocked if she doesn't get an Oscar nomination. Then again, it's a Disney film. It's not a Disney film. Um, it's not a Disney film for kids so much as it is for for adults. So if you, I think you can see it on Disney Plus as well. Check it out. Uh, if you've got a big screen TV, sit relatively close. You want to watch the nuance in her facial expressions. Just little things, and lip and eyebrow movements and, you know, the eyes getting piercing and all. I mean, she's just, I kept leaning over saying to Deb, it's like, is this the best acting we've ever seen? And Deb's like, pretty darn good. So there you go, kids. I will see you again on Thursday for another quarantine happy hour. I'm so glad you could join me today so we could talk about using delays and phase correction to solve audio problems. It was fascinating, right? Bye, you guys.